Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With, a distracted Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? You don't know me. I used to, I used to know you real well. We used to like drink beers together and eat oysters together. You would talk about Korean barbecue. You damn near killed me. You remember that? I do. Hey, by the way, we have a Korean barbecue place here in town. Now I know you always want it. It's pretty good. It's K dog's favorite. She loves it. Hmm. Just saying, no, not yo, yo, yo. Let me speak on this. Uh, but, but my kid, Kansas, you know, you used to know her. She used to call you uncle Bruce. It was cool. It's a long Omaha? time. Yeah. There you go. You remember. So he, oh. here's the deal, man. We're here because it's a very special anniversary. I'm pretty fired up about this one too. As we're talking right now, just yesterday was the 25th anniversary of in your house six known as rage in the cage from the Louisville gardens in Louisville, Kentucky, a live crowd of about 5,500 fans are there. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a full sellout for Louisville gardens. And, uh, Meltzer of course said the company fibbed about the sellout being weeks in advance, but who cares? It's an $83,000 gate. What's your favorite thing you remember about Louisville, Kentucky? You've been there a few times in your day. Um, Danny Davis is probably one of my favorite things, but Danny Davis is no longer in Louisville, Kentucky. So can't he be Danny Davis anymore? But, uh, I absolutely, uh, loved me some Danny Davis. The Louisville gardens was also the place where, uh, Kamala chopped Howard Finkel. And we had to, uh, take Howard out, out the back doors and have the EMTs assess him and make sure that he was okay from that devastating chop. Cause the man is a savage Kamala, the Ugandan warrior. <laughs> and, and you, you got to take all the precautions that you possibly can. Um, I like the downstairs, uh, locker room kind of set up there and, and what have you. And, um, uh, other than that, not much else to like about little, the show here does a 0.75 buy rate, which is oh, wait, they got good fried fish, fried fish. They got fried fish. Actually, corny, corny took me to this fried fish. Go get the fried fish. Wait, he wrote a whole article about that fish place once, didn't he? The, the fish place is good. It's like been there forever and ever. And they, yeah. s- it's done when they sell out like a barbecue place type deal. Right. Yeah. And, and it's really good too. It's really good. And then there was a place, uh, that Danny Davis used to take me to all the time for lunch. That I couldn't tell you the name of it. That was absolutely, I loved Louisville actually. You, you know I, what? I love, I think the one I'm remembering is Clarksville, the Clarksville seafood restaurant, but it's near Louisville, right? I don't know. But I do know that, uh, it's not in Louisville proper. It's, oh you, yeah. Okay. There you go. Clarksville seafood is a delicious decadent of, uh, or delicious descendant of the Cape Cotter restaurants that dotted Louisville and Lexington all through the sixties. There was a location near my house, blah, blah, blah. So Cornette had some deep affection for Clarksville seafood. Yeah, it was good. It was nice. Uh, uh, cornmeal. Old school, like baby. Shit. Yeah. That's South right there. It. Yes. Hush so, puppies. Motherfucker. So the show does a 0.75 buy rate, roughly 150,000 buys on pay-per-view. The price tag is still 1495. 
which, you know, I think we learned uh, not too much longer. What? Maybe a year later. Hey, we don't have to do this anymore. We can charge full price for these some bitches. The same hardcores are going to pay it. Right. Absolutely. And, and they were, you know, and, and WCW proved that WCW went in and started just running monthly pay-per-views and didn't miss a beat. So <laughs> there we are running pay-per-views that were an hour, an hour shorter. However, um, half the price co- Yeah. And it costs the same to produce. Yeah. So why not make the full yeah. rack and it's crazy to think that even though that was so cheap back then, it's still more than the network costs now. So while some fans say, oh, wrestling's not what it used to be. And uh, listen, we all love what we grew up on. It is better to be a fan now when you get all that stuff for even less money. Uh, this show does a much better number than the prior two in your house events. We said this one gets a 0.75 buy rate. Well, in your house four got a, a 0.4 and in your house five got a 0.35. So we're more than double. So this to me feels like, Hey man, 96 is going to be better than 95. No matter how you slice it. Is that because of Sean or is it just cyclical? I just think that, you know, in general business, you know, coming around, I believe business is cyclical, but also at the same time, if you have an attraction, they want to see, they're going to come out and see it. I'm sure some of it being WrestleMania season didn't hurt on commentary tonight. It's Jerry, the King Lawler and Vince McMahon. Uh, I've always really liked that pair. I know people prefer Jr. and the King, but I thought King played well off of Vince. He did because it was that. Now that was a true dichotomy. Instead of having two hillbillies like Jr. and King, here you had the city boy Vince and the hillbilly King. Hillbilly, listen to you. Since we're already talking about Lawler, let's talk is about the some... King of Memphis. He is, no doubt. Okay. Let's talk about some of the shows leading up to this event. Uh, he's doing some crossover work with Lawler's USWA. And on the February 14th USWA show, we had Lawler team up with Jeff Jarrett to beat the undertaker and Bret Hart by DQ. Can you imagine being a wrestling fan? Just a little kid who loves wrestling and shows up to a show like he might normally would. And it's your hometown favorites, Lawler and Jarrett, but the damn undertaker and Bret Hart are there. That's big time stuff. Oh yeah. Especially for Memphis. The show eventually built to a big Memphis event on February 17th at the pyramid, which drew nearly 8,000 paid fans. The gate was 90 grand. Uh, that's gotta be one of the top crowds in that era, at least for Memphis. Uh, the show is a part of the WWF world tour de force. It's headlined by Bret Hart and Jerry Lawler for the WWF title in a salad steel cage. Of course, Bret wins. And there's lots of other top acts, including Sean and loads of USWA talent as well. How easy was it to talk Vince into doing some talent trades and all that for Memphis with Lawler? Well, during this time, and you had, uh, using Memphis as a developmental territory and having a place for guys to go and be able to do live television every Saturday. That to me was a big, big part of learning and, and, in, and in your training. So, uh, having guys be able to go down and work, do a shot for Memphis. If it made sense, not all the time, because after, after a while, then they become normal too. And it's, eh, I've seen that. So we tried to make it work where we could. I know one of the guys that you worked with occasionally down there, Randy Hales, any good Randy Hales stories you can share with us? Not really. I, uh, you know, here, here's the funny thing. I, I didn't, uh, I worked a match with Randy Hales, which was the one and only match I've ever worked as a baby face in my life. Um, and what? I went over, what you wrestled Randy Hales. Yes. in an eight man tag or 10 man tag with Tom and doc and, uh, giant Silva uh, me, I think it might've been an eight man tag or 10 man tag, something like that. Randy Hales was on the other side of that. Yeah. I, Maybe I can't even give you the date, the date of that match. It was 20. God damn Conrad. Um, so it was 22 years ago. It may have been so February 13th, February 13th at the new Daisy theater. And it was the drizzling shits. Um, it, yeah, it sunk giant. Um, yeah. you know what? 
and uh, Bruno downtown Bruno was ringside and broke my ankle in that match. And I'm thinking, what the fuck am I doing in a ring and why? Right. Yeah, it was horrible. It, it was, it was absolutely terrible. Well, I got to look that show up because we, <laughs> we need to see that. Oh God. I hope it doesn't exist. I don't think it exists anywhere on tape, man. Oh, I'm gonna find. Like, I think I banned anyone from. I think I, <laughs> I'm like not a fucking chance in hell. Michael Hayes knocked out Jim Cornette's tooth on that same show. Um, in the same match. It, it wasn't the same match. It was the same show. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was great. And, and Cornette was was shaking, <laughs> trying to get his his tooth on ice and shit. And then he wanted to Sprite, but, uh, yeah, that was taking Michael's working punch. Let's talk about, uh, some injuries coming out of this. Jeff Jarrett. We is, just did corny lost a tooth. Well, that's oh. a few years later. Okay. Uh, Jeff Jarrett suffered a serious back injury on the February 17th show in Memphis, taking a wrong bump against Ahmed Johnson. He's carried out of the ring and hospitalized Meltzer. All right. He's out of the hospital, but no word on when he'll be back. Is this one of the first casualties of Ahmed Johnson? You said recently, very famously, oh, Ahmed didn't discriminate. He'd hurt himself and others. <laughs> yeah. Ahmed could be a little rough on his opponents from time to time. It was, they didn't know where he didn't know where they were going to land and neither did they. On February 16th in Nashville, which also drew a big crowd. Um, we see Ahmed Johnson win a match by DQ when Jarrett hit him with the unified title belt. Uh, apparently the undertaker, uh, razor Ramon and Hunter Hearst Helmsley all no showed the Memphis card. So they put Yoko Zuna on instead of undertaker in the intercontinental title match with gold dust with a walkout finish. So it's an interesting time in the company where we're making shots with other promotions and some guys aren't showing and some guys are injured. And there's even a triangular tag match where they allow locals, Tommy rich and Doug Gilbert to go over the Godwins and the body Donna's. And that's probably got to be kind of funny if you're a local Memphis fan, like, wait a minute, did they just get a win over two WWF tag teams? That's a pretty big deal. Well, again, we work well with our partners. Now to some more news, Vader signed his two-year contract in February. The deal allegedly allows him to still work Japan, but Titan has to approve any U S indie dates, which include the Los Angeles show. He's expected to start full-time on the road after WrestleMania. He injured himself at the in your house show doing a run in as his shoulder hadn't fully recovered from the surgery on February 6th. The reason he wore the overcoat on the in your house show and the sweatshirt on raw was to hide the two large incisions and in arthroscopic hole, which removed part of his AC joint and repaired a torn rotator cuff. He busted open the stitches during the in your house run, but still did a couple of run ins at raw. Do you remember him busting open the stitches here? I remember Leon busting fucking everything open. He was a walking injury. Hmm. Just, I mean, but seriously, it was, you, you, you never, and this terrible thing to say, but you, 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 you never really were able to go, oh my God, this is a bad injury or, oh my God, remember that one? Because every week it was something at this pay-per-view it's announced. We're going to see Yokozuna versus Vader at WrestleMania, but eventually that's changed to a six man. Is that because of Yoko's weight Vader's injury? Or both? All the above. Okay. You had to protect them because neither one of them, you, you put both of them out there and who, the, uh, I don't know, everybody might have just exploded. And it would have gotten all over the fans and it would have been hard to clean up. Uh, in February 8th, McMahon would file a complaint with the pre merger notification office of the FTC's Bureau of Competition. The exact details of the complaint were not available as of press time, but the FTC claimed to not have a copy of it. But McMahon has been trying to get the word out about his complaints. He claimed it wasn't any single action that was so bad on the surface to warrant the complaint, but it was the combination of different actions. Among them is WCW putting nitro up against raw state, uh, starting the show a few minutes early and ending it a few minutes late, which he called unprecedented in television. He also alleges contract tampering with his performers gaining syndicated time slots in some cases that the WBF would have gotten using the leverage of CNN headline news to put together deals or spending more money to buy time 
attempting to drive television advertising rates down by charging less for ad time than the WWF would. And even the name calling on television. And of course, all the silliness on the 900 hotline. I got to tell you in hindsight, this lawsuit from Vince feels a little bit like sour grapes. I mean, he, everything he's suing for here, he did to the territory guys before him. Right. No, it wasn't a lawsuit. It was just a complaint. <laughs> well, that's fair. I agree right? with that. So you complain about shit all you want. I want to file a formal complaint. They're fucking with my business and I don't like it. Yes. It's not illegal. I just don't like it. And I need people to hey, know. Some of it was contract tampering was illegal. I'm not arguing that, but the other shit is like, come on, man. Well, I didn't like it. I understand. In the WBS period of expansion, it also brought out ex- existing established television time slots from regional promoters. It also rated the best drawing talent of regional offices with the lure of them being able to earn a better income and uh, went back into the region with those same headliners. In the case of the AWA in particular, McMahon systematically picked off a large percentage of the key headline talent, both in the ring and behind the scenes, one by one. McMahon practically drove Crockett out of business by putting the first Survivor Series on pay per view on the date Crockett had already booked for his first Starcade pay per view in 87. And of course, virtually every cable company in the country went with McMahon, and Crockett ran a pay per view that he expected to be a major cash windfall that ended up costing him money. So he continues to detail some of these circumstances, but this awfully feels like, I mean, it feels a lot like Vince getting a taste of his own medicine to me. Are you able to see that from the outside at all? Or you just got to sort of toe the line here? No, I, I think that, you know, look, when you go back and look at the history of everything that took place, I think that a lot of the things that Bischoff did, um, were smart. Did he tamper with contracts? Yes. Uh, was that illegal? Yes. Um, doing everything else was out of the box and extraordinary and things that, you know, uh, had never been done before. So it's like, well, wait a minute. Um, they can do this. Well, they could do it because their boss owned the fucking network that they were on. So they could come in early. They could go off late. We didn't have that luxury because we didn't own USA. Um, so yeah, it it was, it was different things that, and the comparison is, is not necessarily fair. It was completely different deal. And, but at the same time, I guess, you know, when you look at the offers that Eric was making and oftentimes get misconstrued, it was, Eric wasn't offering these huge money, uh, offers, uh, he was offering good money, but a different work schedule and allowing guys to have a completely different, you know, they didn't have to have to work four or five times a week. They came and did TV for a lot of them. That's all they did. So he was offering them something different in an alternative to what they were already doing. Um, again, you, you look at it and it was, it was different business and it was, they were coming from a place where they had no ad revenue. So, uh, going in and being able to sell their ad, uh, ad revenue for less didn't hurt them because they didn't have any to begin with. So it, it hurt us because all of a sudden it, it's, they're selling it for pennies on the dollar and, um, yeah, shit happens. But how are they? How are they doing business wise now? WCW. Yeah. I mean, I think they're making a comeback. Okay. Cool. That's what I heard. All right. Let's uh, let's keep it going here. Meltzer would say, when it comes to television ad rates, WCW officials have claimed that their ads for the entire network for a thirty second spot are nineteen thousand, while the WBFs are fifteen thousand, claiming it's actually the WBF undercutting them. McMahon lists figures of 25,000 for WWF and 18,000 for WCW. Since McMahon's shows deliver a small audience and yet he's charging more, he's made the claim they're undercutting him. According to a third party buyer, the figure McMahon has claimed would be accurate. Uh, do you remember what ad rates were back in 87? We're talking about what they are here. And <laughs> no, I'm just saying when you're in no, the WWF, I don't, I, I, again, I didn't deal in that. I didn't, I had, I had no clue at all. 
We ain't got to get hot about it. I'm just I'm saying. Not half hot. It feels already, like. Already. Here we start off. It's fucking nice. It's early in the morning. I'm all refreshed. I had a bowl of cereal. And now you're already pissing me off. Okay. For the most recent ratings weekend, which will be the week ending January 28th, WCW was on 177 stations and the various cable networks reach a total of 6.7 million homes. The WWF has 161 stations and USA would hit 4.77 million homes. So the biggest possible rating for WCW there is a 7.1 compared to a 5.0 for the WWF. How important was syndication here in 1996? It feels like less than in years past. In 96, a lot less than it wasn't, it was different and it depended upon which book you wanted to, to look at, whether you wanted to look at Arbitron or you wanted to look at uh, another book, all that shit could be twisted and turned and, and made. <laughs> I was going through some of Paul Bosch's stuff the other day and found some, uh, what I call JR math of, he would just take the highest ratings in certain markets and combine them and, and then put that out as a press release. Oh my God, look at this great rating leaving out, you know, the, the hash marks in yeah. major markets like LA and Chicago and different things like that. And again, it's nothing more than marketing. Um, so, so much of that was depending upon how people read them and what they were looking for. Well, depending on how you slice the numbers here, I could argue the WBF is still ahead. I would also argue that, um, the show is not, it's not bad. I actually kind of like this show. Let's talk about pay-per-views for 96 very briefly. I think most fans consider Starcade the, uh, the best show or the biggest show that WCW puts on. Well, here in 96 Starcade, of course, is in December, several months after this, and it does 350,000 buys. WrestleMania, of course, is the, uh, the primo show for the WWF. It does 300,000 buys. So technically Starcade wins, but I think by December, the business looks so much differently than it did in March. It's really not even fair to compare. Uh, let's talk about another story that doesn't get a lot of headlines. We've briefly touched on it before. Davy boy Smith is on trial for eight days on charges of aggravated assault. This is all coming from a 1993 fight in a bar where Davy boy was accused of causing permanent brain damage to a 22 year old who was flirting with his wife. This is a big story in Canada, especially after Davy boy testified on the stand that wrestling was fake quote, every single thing in wrestling is a fake. He said from the witness box while defending himself against this aggravated assault trial. Uh, what do you remember about Davy boys situation here? Not a lot. Uh, you know, it was an unfortunate situation in that, uh, you had a fight and you win the fight and because you're a professional athlete, um, and famous and have money, people are going to come after you. Uh, you know what, Conrad, I could really get on my soapbox here, but I won't just in general about what I think is wrong with, with the world and the country right now. Well, I'm glad you're not because Jr. would, uh, let's recap the, the setting this day. You know what's wrong with the ah, right now, Conrad, July 25th, 1993. People don't, it, it's like kids growing up. None of them have ever gone back behind the Minimax and had a goddamn fight. Okay. Nobody's ever been punched in the fucking mouth. And I think if more kids growing up got punched in the mouth, then they would have a little more respect and you'd have a different world. So I just want to recap. I want to make sure all the news sites are reporting and quoting you accurately. <laughs> Bruce Pritchard is on the record saying, punch your kids in the face. It'll fix the world. No, not us. Oh, well you said Other kids need to fight amongst themselves. All right. Kids punch each other in the face. It'll fix the world. That's if you got a dispute, goddamn, don't go to a fucking hire a therapist at $800 a goddamn hour. Just punch each other in the face real hard. Punch each other in the face until somebody can't take the punch anymore. They submit, you shake hands, you move on. I don't know that that's really a good plan. Work for me. <laughs> I can tell three time karate black belt, all of Famer. Working with, on four. With fake. That reminds me, I got to make that call and find out where that fourth fucking goddamn induction is. 
July 25th, 1993, Cody Light is a 22 year old and they're at the back alley bar in South Calgary. Davy boys with his wife. And he says he's had about four beers. I suggest that's probably a little more than that. And he goes to the dance floor around one twenty to tell his wife it's time to leave for the evening. And that's when he first meets this Cody light character who was described as being six foot three, 180 pounds and a student. And he said that, uh, light appeared at his side, grabbed his right hand, shook it vigorously and repeatedly said, you got a nice fucking wife. And the court heard that light had asked Diana for a dance and that light was waiting for Diana. When Smith appeared, Smith said he didn't see the exchange between his wife and light. And I said, quote, thank you very much. I just wanted to let go and leave. And then light lunched or lurched forward. Lunch might've been better. And fearing light would headbutt him. Smith said he put light into a wrestling hole known as a face lock. And he walked light backwards about three meters to a rear door and left him with two bouncers. I told him this guy's trying to cause a problem. Get him away from me. I don't really see how this is that huge of a deal here, but eventually he turned his back to meet his wife. And then he turned to see light lying unconscious on the bar room's concrete floor. And a lot of other people have testified that Davy boy actually punched light in the face after light asked Smith's wife for a dance. And Peter McKenzie, a friend of Cody's, uh, said, um, that light fell to the floor after the punch and that Smith then put him in a reverse headlock, dragged him across the room and rammed his head into a brick wall. And this is all happening while he's working in the wrestling business and he's on this card. This has to be something you're at least having a conversation about, right? Like I said, I, I vaguely remember it, but. Obviously, I wasn't there. Now, had they gone back behind the Minimax and met and just had a fight, then everything would have been okay. Well, I think they did that inside, and it caused some legal problems. Well, I don't know. You got one guy who's a friend of the one guy who has a different story. Who, You know, all that shit, who the hell ever really knows? Yeah, it's he said, she said. Yeah. The biggest story of all around this time is of course the click giving notice or at least two of them. Uh, this is in the March 4th, 1996 observer in a situation spoken of with some disdain by the WBF CEO, Vince McMahon, Scott Hall sent a telegram to McMahon on February 21st, officially giving his 90 day notice that he was leaving the company on the same day. Hall was suspended by the WBF for six weeks for reason, theoretically having nothing to do with him giving notice causing him to miss his scheduled appearances this past weekend. The suspension would take him a few days past WrestleMania, which Hall was no doubt counting on as his last big payday before leaving with him gone. The WWF will set up a gimmick match with gold dust against Roddy Piper for the vacant slot. Since they started working in that direction on the February 26th raw show with gold dust doing a sexually suggestive phone interview, talking about Piper and wanting to play his bagpipes. While Hall would be eligible to return on April 3rd and work out the remainder of his notice, the general belief is that he'll be sitting out until he can join WCW. In an interview, Scott Hall said, so back then in your contract, you were required to give your 90 day notice in advance in writing. And I'll be darned if I didn't fail a piss test the next day. And it was six weeks old. And I went, wow, I guess they got my notice. What do you think of the timing of the drug suspension? And Scott Hall saying that's awfully convenient. Well, I have no idea as far as the drug suspension because I wasn't involved in the drug testing. That was an independent deal that that they did. So I have no idea. All I know is that we had, you know, going into WrestleMania, we did have Razor and Gold Dust scheduled for a feature match and was told, hey, guys, you lost Razor Ramon for six weeks. Um not an ideal situation in any way, shape or form. So we weren't told, you know, you can't be, uh, what they were gone for six weeks for. He's just put two and two together. And so, yeah, fucked up our WrestleMania and had to find something else quickly. Let's talk a little bit about doll hairs for a minute. Uh, because we've got, what's that? Doll hairs, doll hairs. Yeah. Uh, it's in the uh, observer razor is believed oh, to have well, earned approximately $270,000 in 95, 
well down from what he earned in 94, which was in excess of 400,000. And he would also say he's been unhappy recently. And everybody knows that because he didn't want to feud with gold dust. He wanted to work with either Hunter or the one, two, three kid, but he was also unhappy with the baby bottle and diaper angle. And he had been missing some late, some house shows, or he had been late and he's citing family pressures, but now he's got an offer of guaranteed money, perhaps long-term and an easier road schedule. So it's a bit of a no brainer for him. Were you surprised when the notice came in? Yeah, I was surprised because again, we, we had been, that's when we shot the, uh, the whole deal and angle with gold dust and had plenty of opportunity, had meetings with Vince, had plenty of opportunity to tell Vince face to face. So yeah, shocking. By the way, uh, $270,000 and 95 would be about $470,000 now just to give a frame of reference. But I mean, that was probably the case for everybody, right? 94 was a better year in the business than 95 financially for everyone. I'd probably depend on whoever, but the business is better. Yes. Uh, there is some bitterness within the WWF for how hall handled the departure since he was on the road with the entire office crew Sunday through Tuesday, giving no indication he was leaving. He was booked prominently in both the tag team title tournament and an angles Planned for a street fight against Goldust. The latter was planned to take theoretically in Miami on a downtrodden street and beamed in live via satellite as part of the WrestleMania show. Either way, though, it's uh it's not good. When the office crew returns back after booking Ramon in a strong position for the future, they have a telegram of him giving notice. A telegram. That feels like this is from the like the 1800s or something, a telegram. Do you remember it being a telegram? Yeah, I think it was either a telegram or a certified letter or something like that. Not long after that, March 5th, 1050 AM, Kevin Nash phoned Vince McMahon to give his notice as well. We all know this would wind up leading to the WCW's boom period for the next several years, but several interviews have indicated that Nash made his decision to leave right after this in your house show. Uh, he said once in an interview with our friend, Sean Oliver over at kayfabe commentaries, that there was an incident that ensured that he was going to renew his contract or he was not going to renew it. Rather, he's supposed to hit the Jack knife and be set to win the match until the undertaker comes through the ring. But Nash said, Brett refused to take his finish and Brett says, no, thinking people will feel like he was beat. And Nash says, taker who never says anything jolts up out of his chair and says, motherfucker, not everything is about you. This helps our match mean more at WrestleMania, but they got there the day of, and Vince made the call that Brett was not going to take the power bomb, but Nash says this change was the straw that broke the camel's back. Have you heard that story before? Oh, I've heard it before. You know, look, I, I think that I think Kevin and Scott both had their minds made up and I think Kevin had his mind made up long before that. This was just, I think, I think it's a convenient excuse. There you go. Um, I don't know what, you know, what Kevin was thinking. I don't claim to be in Kevin's mind. I just think that if I were a Betty man, I think that Kevin had his mind made up a long time ago. Yeah. I kind of agree because it's not like, well, if Brett takes the power bomb, he's sticking around. Fuck off. Yeah. That's not real. All right. Let's get to the show itself. Uh, the show got, uh, 55.4% thumbs up 25.9% thumbs down. 18.7% thumbs in the middle. Most everyone agreed Sean and Owen were the match of the night. Uh, and it was a toss up as to what was the worst match Yoko and Davey or Jake and Tatanka. Uh, Meltzer would describe this show as basically more to build WrestleMania than stand alone on its own. But Bruce in hindsight, aren't er it isn't usually most shows between the rumble and WrestleMania. They're all building to WrestleMania, right? Well, that's kind of what promotion companies do. Yeah. I mean, that's a no brainer. Uh, Meltzer would say, while the show was generally well-received, I was in the minority on this one. Sean and Owen had an excellent match, but from a wrestling standpoint, it was a one match show. Brett and diesel's main event cage match was terrible up to the creative ending where undertaker came from under the ring to pull diesel under and allow Hart to escape the cage as expected Hart Once again, came out of the match devalued as a champion going into the biggest show of the year. The show was largely designed to set up Michael's expected win over Hart by giving Michael's a strong, clean win over an established star and the diesel undertaker match, plus the Vader Yoko match. All three were well accomplished, but in doing so two of the top three matches on the show itself suffered. 
I don't know, man. I disagree. Maybe that's me. There is a pre-show match. This is back in the free for all era. It's Jake Roberts getting a win over Tatanka with a DDT in five minutes and 36 seconds. Uh, Meltzer would say Roberts got the big pop coming out, but his loose ring top couldn't hide that he was terribly out of shape. He blew up fast. And judging from the comments here, a large percentage of fans noticed dud. We talked about the huge pop that he got at the Royal rumble. Here we are in our, our backup effort, our next sophomore effort, right with him. And that's another big pop, but man, he didn't look like the Jake of old. When do you remember this being an issue? I mean, clearly, you know, cause you've got him a new top designed. What can you tell us about Jake here? When that goddamn bell rang, you know, it was and not being hidden by 29 other guys. Um, look, everybody knew that Jake was in no shape to go out and have matches of old. However, the attraction of Jake, the snake Roberts, I think still held water and Jake still was able to cut some of the most compelling promos in the business thought if we could get there and, and make Jake an attraction, um, there might be something, but putting Jake regularly in matches, not the greatest idea in the world. Talk to me about the free for all and how this is, I mean, this is important. We've got Cornette come out with Vader and they're saying, oh, he's going to be here tonight. Oh, he's going to be involved. We're going to get him on this card or something like that. But the free for all, this is like a last minute infomercial to buy the pay-per-view, right? Absolutely. It was on the, uh, TV guide channel. It was a, it was a marker channel that people on cable it had. And basically it just was your channel guide. This was a television show that people that are going to their channel guide, their TV guide and looking for, uh, What's coming on at, hey, what's coming on at 6.30? And you see this show. In addition, it also ran free prior to the pay-per-view itself on the pay-per-view channel. So you saw this. It was free. And hopefully it was one last-ditch effort to let you know you got one last chance to buy the pay-per-view live. Now we're on to the pay-per-view itself. For the past several months, Razor and the one, two, three kid have been involved in a slow burn feud that began with the two as friends, but then a rocky relationship after kid lost a match for the two against the smoking guns before long, one, two, three kid is the full fledged heel and he joins the million dollar corporation. So now we got to end this bitter feud somehow. Why not a baby bottle match? So razor pins the one, two, three kid here in 12 minutes and one second in a baby bottle match kid comes out with a stroller and a Ramon teddy bear Meltzer would say kid looks smaller than normal in the 180 pound range. Even with the size difference, they had a good match. Ted DiBiase threw baby powder in Ramon's eyes to give kid an advantage. Kid used a lengthy sleeper, which neither Ramon nor the announcers had a clue how to effectively sell and went over the head of most of the crowd as well. Finally, Ramon broke the hole by crotching kid on the ropes. They went to several near falls before DiBiase distracted the ref and threw baby <laughs> through the baby bottle to kid kid poured the powder in his hands. But when Ramon turned around, he kicked kid in the hands and the powder went into kids own eyes. Razor then used the razor's edge and finished the pin on kid, but did so after a second one. And then Ramon put the baby bottle in kid's mouth through powder in DiBiase's eyes. Put a diaper on kid and poured baby powder all over him. When kid revived in the ring, he started crying three stars. Bruce, you know, you make fun of what they did in ECW all the time. And you even make fun of the shit they did in Memphis, but this is more Memphis than Memphis and ECW ever were. What the fuck was this? Who booked this shit? This is highly entertaining. Got three stars from the little bitch boy in California. Buddy. And by the way, 180 pounds for one, two, three kid. Is he making reference to how huge kids kid looked or what? Help me understand. I, I'm trying. I, I don't understand what that reference is about either. Is it? But it was an entertainment match. It was an entertaining thing. Being a crybaby and you're going to, you're going to act like a crybaby. you going to treat you like a cry baby going to give you a baby bottle make you suck on the baby bottle put you in a baby bonnet and powder your little bottom and give you a diaper is this brought to us by the same creative genius who did dog food strong dog food i'm just saying baby bottle seriously if this was anywhere else 
if, if they were running a, a baby bottle match on another promotion right now, you would be shitting on it left and right. Not if it was done. Well, you thought this was done well. Yeah, I did. Uh, you didn't think it was done well. I just, listen, I love the performers. I think they are very capable of having a great match, but my God, this diaper shit in a bottle, make, it, make it a big deal out of goddamn baby powder. What, what kind of other kind of powder are you going to use in a goddamn baby bonnet, baby diaper match? <laughs> we don't need to have the match is the point. Oh, so you didn't want us to have a match. Okay. Not about a regular one. Just, you know, Hey, these guys are heated. The, I'm the, pretty they, sure that this had escalated into a goddamn baby bottle match. I really hope that there is a baby bottle match this year on WrestleMania. Fuck the hell in the cells and the last man standings. Everybody knows you're going to blow a feud off. Get that goddamn diaper out. Well, yeah, and we did. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, I love when you're cantankerous just for the sake of being so in hindsight, you book razor with gold dust. He's not happy with that. You pivot, you put him in a baby bottle match. Is it really that much of a shock he's putting in his notice? Well, I guess he missed that uh, backlot brawl. Up next, a feud that's been. Fight. Let's talk about another pay per view quality match Duke the Dumpster, Drossy, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. They wrestled at the Royal Rumble preview show for the number 30 spot. Drossy wound up winning. And now he's he's got his head shaved. He's doing a pre match interview. He totally botches the promo. He skips over Todd Pettengill and says his entire spiel before basically running out of stuff to say and having to repeat it. One of the worst promos you'll see Hunter pins Duke in nine minutes and 38 seconds. Wow. What'd you think? Ooh, is rough. Not that good. Not that good at all. Meltzer would say Helmsley is improving and the match was significantly better than the rumble match after a power slam Duke used his new finishing maneuver called the trash compactor, which is a spinning power slam. He left the ring to get the garbage can. He threw the lid in the ring and accidentally hit Helmsley in the mouth and apparently split his lip open. And he tried to bring the can in the ref stopped him and Helmsley got the lid hit uh, Duke with it. And there's your pin star and a half. So listen, he's, he's yeah, got himself on that great. Yeah, this is it for him when prime time, is it not? Yeah, it just was. It just was sloppy and plotting and 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 waiting for shit. It just wasn't comfortable to watch. wasn't good. Yeah, it's less than good. Um, he's gonna leave the company in the summer of '96. I think his last televised match was a loss to T.L. Hopper at July. So that tells you where your life is if you're losing to T.L. Hopper. You're not long for this world. So I'm Teal Hopper. Well, he's just a job guy. I mean, I like him. Great. He's not a job guy. He had well, he, he won. <laughs> he beat, he beat him. But the yeah. point is. Sure. Okay. That's what it is. So he's not just a job guy. It's T.L. Hopper. He's a goddamn plumber by trade. What about Salvatore sincere? He's top. Draw. He was sincere by trade. Yokozuna is going to go ahead and get a win over Davy boy here by DQ and five Oh five. When Jim Cornette hits Yoko with the tennis racket three times, uh, Smith did about as good as one can do. Given Yoko has no conditioning and can no longer do a singles match. Now as a face, Yoko spoke for the first time and Mr. Fuji seems to have disappeared, I guess. So nobody else can win his award. Yokozuna didn't sell any of the racket shots and stalked Cornette until Vader came running in Vader and Smith did a double team on Yoko. With Vader finally putting the uh, handcuffs on and cuffing Yoko to the corner, the two continued to beat on Yoko. He made several comes back comebacks before being beaten down. And then all the agents, including for the first time on a pay-per-view, the former George Steele came out and the noted Clint, uh, Clarence Mason ran in to break things up. I mean, I guess this is okay. We're definitely trying to build towards Yoko and Vader here, but. I would have liked to have seen Davey have a different opponent here. Maybe Davey yeah. and Hunter could have had a match. My goodness. Yeah, it's pretty fucking awful. And it was just sad, you know, at this point to see Yoko and see what kind of shape he was in and, and just unable to move. And it, and it just, yeah, I mean, you can work around and do as much as you want to do all around him, but it still was painful to watch. 
What do you think in hindsight, if Yoko could have dropped the weight, would he have been a big baby face? Would that have worked? I think, yeah. I mean, if you could have got the Yoko of old without a doubt, the Yoko of old could have been a hell of a baby face for the company. All right. If you're going to watch one match on this show, it should probably be the next one. Sean versus Owen. Their feud started back in the fall of 95. Of course, Sean Michaels took a hiatus from wrestling due to that injury after the real life attack in Syracuse. They talked about it on air, but then Owen Hart hit that enziguri. Sean Michaels kayfabe blacked out. He's going to tease retirement, but announce he's in the rumble. He wins the rumble and Owen is still taunting Michaels, taking credit for the injury. And now we have a match here and Michaels even puts up his title opportunity. So if you can beat me, you can have my shot at the title at WrestleMania. They get plenty of time too. 15 minutes and 57 seconds. Sean gets the win. Uh, uh, Michaels is going to dance on the roof of the in your house set and use a rope to come down, uh, for his ring entrance. This is sort of a precursor for WrestleMania 12 with that entrance, huh? No, it was just a little baby one, a little baby one, little baby one. Uh, Meltzer would say the two had the expected excellent match, although nowhere close to the Bret Hart Davy boy match in December. Michaels in the early moments did a twisting plancha off the top rope onto the floor. Lots of really cool stuff here. Eventually Owen hits that enziguri, which is the key storyline point, And it knocks Shawn Michaels to the floor. Hart then brings Michaels back in, but Sean kicks out. Of course we see Sean go for the super kick, but miss. And then Owen goes for the enziguri and miss. And finally Sean hits the super kick and that's all she wrote. Four stars, pretty good match here. Two of the best in the world at this point. Owen is still probably underrated here, but man, if you're trying to get somebody ready and show them what they can do as a top guy, is there a better opponent than Owen Hart? Motherfucker. Owen Hart was just so great at everything he did and, I, and effortless. It was, it was effortless on Owen's part. Owen knew where to be, when to be there and was able to tell a great story in any situation that you put him in. And this was a prime example. Owen knew what he was out there to do. Owen was out there to make Sean look like the guy that could be the next champion. And in that made Owen Hart, Sean was out there to make Owen Hart so that he beat somebody. And it was just a clinic of anybody that wants to go back and learn why, why do guys do the things they do in the ring and why do they make so, some things make sense and why some things don't make sense. This would be a match to go back and watch and say, holy shit, th- these two guys, when we call it dancing, made beautiful music together. It's a cool visual too. Just, you know, Sean on the top of the roof. I mean, he has a big star presence here. What, how did I, we know how Owen and Brett got along, obviously as brothers. And we know the, the storyline and the real life situation being different, but we also know that at different times, Brett and Sean got along other times. It was just a professional rivalry. Other times they just fucking hated each other. What was Owen and Sean's relationship? Like everybody liked Owen, first of all. So it was kind of hard to not like Owen and, and be adversarial in any way, shape or form. And I think that Owen worked. Owen didn't, I was going to say Owen worked hard to have good relationships, but he really didn't. He just had to be himself in so many ways. Uh, Owen was professional. I think that Owen would, um, as far as family, Owen's going to back up family and and stand behind him. But at the same time, when it's time to do business, Owen's going to do business and do what's right for business. That's the kind of person that he was. So, um, pretty straightforward that I think they had a, they had a good relationship as good as it could possibly be. They were professional. And it's logical in storyline that on Brett's way to winning the world title at WrestleMania 10, he lost to Owen. Well now here, Sean beats Owen. Uh, now it's time for our main event of the evening. It's a match that we've seen on pay-per-view a lot. It's diesel versus Brett. That happened at the King of the ring in 94, the Royal rumble in 95 and even survivor series 95. Uh, Diesel won the first match by DQ. The second match was a no contest. The third match, Brett won. But at the Rumble 96, Brett and the Undertaker's match is interrupted by Diesel. So Gorilla Monsoon announces he's putting Brett and Diesel in a 15 foot high steel cage. I like these old blue cages. This is one of the last appearances we would see. We would only see it a handful more times. I think probably SummerSlam 97 might have been the last. Maybe they did it once more after WrestleMania 14. Either way though, the old classic blue cage 
you had a, a nickname for it. And I think Briscoe had it for years at his body shop, right? Yeah. Old blue. It was fucking horrible. A little snug, <laughs> little snug, not, not as snug as the elimination chamber, but fucking snug. Well, the match itself here gets plenty of time. It's in a cage. Remember the name of the show was in your house. Six rage in the cage. They go 1913. Um, Meltzer would say live. He was told diesel was about 70% of the cheers, but a lot of it was attributed to the USWA television show that aired this weekend where Hart was doing several heel interviews for his match in Memphis with Jerry Lawler. Uh, Meltzer would say, I don't think the portrayal of Hart as a guy who was lucky to be champion and doesn't really deserve it in this day and age helps. With the exception of the Smith match in December, which was the perfect match to get the champion over and the belt. Hart lurked into the belt or lucked into the belt in a match. Diesel should have won, but was too nice of a guy. And then undertaker should have beaten him twice, but diesel saved his ass both times, which is the last thing fans want to see involving a baby face champion against a popular challenger because the natural reaction to begin with is you want to see a title change. Brett's been pretty vocal about this too, that he didn't like the booking on the way to WrestleMania 12. He felt like you did him no favors between winning it at survivor series and WrestleMania. How would you respond to that criticism? Well, I think that first of all, I thought that it was a good story and you were using Brett to tell another story with undertaker and diesel. You were using Sean over here. And the idea was Brett was going away after WrestleMania 12. Um, not everybody knew that, but Brett was going away. We didn't know how long Brett was going to go away. We didn't know if it was going to be three months or six months or, or what it would be. So on the way there, you needed to use Brett to tell these other stories, right? So how much do you really want to invest to make Brett an unstoppable champion if he's going away after the big show and you have to start building new people? So I'll defend the the creative all day long because, again, we had to build to what we knew that we were going to have when we're done with WrestleMania 12. Let's, uh, let's keep it going here. Talking about the match. Meltzer would say anyway, the first 15 minutes of the match were boring as diesel was just so limited and what he can do in a match where the object is to climb and he's not climbing, even forgetting the confines of the match. Diesel looked slow and unimpressive and heart lacked fire. It picked up in the last few minutes and had a great finish as diesel was about to go out the door to win undertaker came from under the ring and grabbed his foot and dragged him under the ring. And special effects of smoke under the ring went through the ring canvas. Hart then escaped the cage to win, but come out of the show once again as a second tier star underneath Undertaker, Diesel, Michaels, and Vader. Diesel then climbed back from under the ring with his pants torn and climbed the cage, quote unquote, running away from Undertaker to show he was afraid of him. Ironically, after largely being cheered during the match, Diesel was almost 100% booed afterwards star and a half. So I think the booing is really more indicative of they love the undertaker more than they love diesel. That's okay. I mean, he's more established and more the legacy character. What'd you think of the finish? And, and what do you think of the, uh, the idea that, Hey, this isn't the right kind of match for diesel. Cause he's not going to be climbing. Well, again, it was, you can go through the door, a lot of different ways to do it. And I thought that the match was a good match. Actually, you go back and watch it and it's a decent match. They were telling a story. And when you get to that story at the end, it was to get to the story of undertaker. Now is going to fucking keep this one from diesel. That was the story of this match. And you know, the, the thing that we didn't do that was actually Kevin Nash's idea that I so badly wanted to do. And I actually remember going back to Vince and, and making a second pitch at it going, God, I know this sounds crazy, but I think it'd really be good. Is that once undertaker pulled diesel into the hole and got diesel uh, underneath in the hole that when diesel reappeared, that he had a gray streak in his hair. And I thought, Oh my God, that's so fucking great. 
And I think that it was ruled that it would be too hokey and like, hang on, man. <laughs> We're cutting the yeah. hole in the middle of the ring, pulling the guy into the depths of hell. All this smoke billows out and all this shit. Like they just opened the door to mine and Briscoe's room at fucking two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and the fucking goddamn guy coming out with a gray streak is too fucking hokey. Um, I just thought that would have been cool and, and would have added to it a little bit and, and we didn't do it, obviously, but I do think that would have been a nice, fun addition. But to get to the stories, to tell all of the stories that we wanted to tell at the end of the day, I thought it did a magnificent job of it. Do you think they borrowed that idea a little bit in TNA when they did the broken Matt Hardy thing? He just randomly had the gray streak. So I didn't see that, but maybe. Maybe. Yeah, well, no, I have no idea because I didn't see it. That's back when you would make me watch things that just oh, like and, and you, you would you would fucking kidnap me in your living room and make me watch shit randomly. Well, and that was one of you gonna act like that wasn't entertaining. Sometimes it was. Sometimes it's fucking brutal. I, I just wanted to go upstairs to my wing. I, you you know, mean to me. You kidnap you kidnap me. You're, you're and then, and then like when I had, and by the way, by the way, you took the, you, you took away my access on your Sonos and all that other shit. I, I got rid, I got rid of the whole goddamn little box where I had all the Conrad house house apps. Are you serious? Cause you just, just continued all my passwords and shit. That's not true. It is too true. Well, here's the deal. You better not be trying to turn on lights and shit from up at your house at my house. That's <laughs> dirty. <laughs> I didn't. End up. Well, I did it. And then you got mad and you like took my password away from me. I don't remember doing that. I, I don't think this match sucked as bad as everybody else does, but do you think Nash's heart just wasn't in it? I do. I do think his heart wasn't in it. Cause he knew he was leaving. When you think about cage matches, did the WWF just fuck it all up with this escape to win thing? Or did you think it added suspense? That's not the WWF, man. That's, you know, and again, it's first of all, it's, it's the Sheik and Bruno. And it was shit that they used to do in uh, Detroit and Toronto. And then Vince senior did it so that Bruno wouldn't have to do a job. Okay. Um, and then it just became the norm. So yes, to me in the South, a cage match was the blow off. That was the definitive nobody in, nobody out. And only Anderson fucked it up by putting the top on the goddamn cage. Nobody in, nobody out. They can't even climb over the top and then raise the fucking cage in the middle of the goddamn, uh, match. So only fucked up the cage, uh, the Southern cage, uh, worse than anybody. And then all bets were off and fucking just cages become a prop. What'd you think of Roddy Piper's interview on the show? They're interviewing him as they're setting up the cage and he's just flying off the cuff. He's pinching Cornette in the butt. He's saying of the Yokozuna Vader match at WrestleMania, let the blood flow. Uh, and throughout the segment, Vince just keeps saying there's only one Roddy Piper. There's only one Roddy Piper. Is he well, just cause there's only one Roddy Piper. <laughs> there was, he was reiterating it. Oh, there's only one Piper pretty crazy and then from there okay oh wow one two he got it. no he didn't oh no one two he got it oh no <laughs> <laughs> piper had one of the more interesting 96s of anyone he's going to be in wrestlemania against Goldust. he's even got a main event starcade against hogan it's pretty crazy to think about what all he accomplished here and Meltzer would say with the exception of possibly michaels it appeared the most over performer on the show was roddy piper was that always the case? You just knew, Hey man, Scott Hall don't want to do it. Well, let's go over here and break this glass in case of emergency. Get us a Piper. We'll be fine. There was a time that that worked. And then there was a time that that ran its course. Um, bless his heart. This was definitely one of those times that I felt plugging Robbie in was the right thing to do. By the way, that wasn't the end of the show. That is what you finished on pay-per-view. If you got the Coliseum video release, you got more. And of course, if you were in the crowd, you got more. Ahmed Johnson would <coughs> pin Isaac Yankum DDS in a pretty bad match. Surprise. Jeff Jarrett was supposed to be there, but he's hurt. And if I was Jeff, I would probably claim I was hurt to stay out of the ring with Ahmed too. 
Next up, we get the Godwins pinning the uh, body Donna's. It was reported to be a pretty good match and then undertaker working with gold dust. And it was a count out win for the undertaker. So gold dust keeps the intercontinental title. Meltzer would say he heard this match was pretty bad. Undertaker gold dust. That's an interesting thing. That's like out of a time capsule right there. Oof. Yeah. I can only imagine, especially after that night. Let's wrap things up here after the pay-per-view ended, but a segment that was taped that'll probably air on the syndicated shows. Jake Roberts did an interview talking about the years where he was addicted to alcohol and cocaine, but he's back in wrestling to glorify the Lord. And he also said his snake is no longer named Damien, but now revelations. So talk to me a little bit about the presentation here and why it made sense to get a, a fresh paint of coat out for Jake. Well, because I think that most people <laughs> kind of saw Jake in, in that one way. And it was an opportunity, you know, from Jake's point of view that Jake felt very strongly about, or at least outwardly uh, felt strongly about wanting to get that message out. So we wanted to try it. You know, we don't like doing politics and religion. In this case, it was a, it was a message of, hey, kids, don't do drugs. Look what can happen to you. Um, and Jake, you know, wanting to do a, a positive spin on things and be able to utilize Jake to be the guy that goes out and, and later on we had, uh, what we called, a a, a no BS tour, uh, that you would take guys like Bradshaw and Farouk and, and different guys that had lived, lived a hard life, made mistakes and go out and give kids the the no bullshit message. This was the precursor to the, that. And this was Jake going out and telling his story of, hey, man, I was a drug addict and I was an alcoholic. And you can't get your life back on track. So that was the idea behind it. Let's do some questions here. We got lots of questions about this show. One of them that I want to ask before we get to all the fan questions it feels like given the fact that you, this Owen Enziguri putting Sean on the shelf was so memorable in 95 that perhaps you could have saved this Owen Sean match for post WrestleMania and gotten a main event out of it where Owen could say, yeah, not only did I kick your head into the third row, I knocked you unconscious and I'm going to do it and put you on the shelf and claim my world title this Sunday at so-and-so pay-per-view instead we do it right before could that have worked or did the company at that point just not see Owen as a pay-per-view main event? Well, again, I think that he, it was here with Sean and it was an opportunity to get us to that point. That's what the story was. And it was Owen and we needed to finish that up before we got to WrestleMania. Lots of questions about the little girl in the ring. Uh, she's here celebrating with Shawn Michaels. Shawn's asking for some kisses. Uh, how are the, the kids who were involved in the scenes in the ring selected? Is it usually someone they knew or the boys just call an audible and go do it? It would depend. Sometimes it would be somebody that they knew and a lot of times they have no idea who this was, but a lot of times it was someone that they knew. Lenny Bakken wants to know, was the decision made to hold this event in Louisville made to accommodate Jim Cornette's dislike for travel? Yeah, 100%, except, see, Lenny, the whole of that story is is that Jimmy was still living in Connecticut. You know he had to be stomping around, what a goddamn rib. Goddamn, where's mama? My mama's here. Dan wants to know, is the big blue cage in the warehouse somewhere? Uh, have you thought about cutting it into pieces and selling it, or did Conrad already buy it? No, I don't uh, have it. I'd like to cut it into pieces, wherever the hell it is. Burn it. Just melt it all down and then make like a necklace, like uh Kyle Mustafa's. <laughs> uh, Michael says, maybe I'm just old school, but this version of the steel cage is still my favorite. Uh, why Bruce was this changed many times over the years? The style I feel like I like the best is because it was easiest for viewers to see through. What say you? Well, Michael, you never had to work in the damn thing. That's what I say. Okay. It was painful. It is easier to see though. He's onto something there. Okay. 
Craig says, Hey guys, this is a question for both of you. Do you think in 95 razor Ramon could have been a credible heel going for the WWE championship against diesel, a razor Ramon, uh, a heel razor Ramon would have been a great storyline. Of course he started as a heel, but I mean, do you think it could have worked razor and diesel for the title? Well, then everybody would have bitched about the click working together. Well, we're going to do that. No we matter what. can't do that. But I mean, you, you did that a lot with Sean and, and, and Nash. So why not them? You just want to argue today. I can tell. Well, you woke me up so goddamn early. I hate you for that. Uh, Meltzer would say, <laughs> just like fired you up. We're done with that. Scott Steele says all the two hour. Me up, Conrad. What's your next question? I don't have one, but Scott Stessel does. He says, okay. Uh, all the two hour in your house pay-per-views had dark matches after the show. I went to the buried alive in Indianapolis. I remember the new rockers versus the Godwins, uh, while Sean Michaels closed with gold dust. What's fabulous about that buried alive is we're, we're led to believe that we have just witnessed a real murder. A man has been buried here. He's dead. No murder. Well, he's no buried. Murder. Okay. He's buried alive. Yeah. Okay. We just saw a man buried alive. Yeah. Next up the Godwins. <laughs> yeah. Run to the don't ring. Don't mess with country boy, country boy, country boy. Don't go mess with country boy. Don't mess with country boy. Pete wants to know what would have been the long-term plans for diesel and razor had they not given their notice. So you had something penciled in, right? Well, diesel would have gone with undertaker. Yeah. That still happened. We got that. What? Yeah. Wait, when, you, but it would have gone on. It would have gone on through the summer and would have continued on. Razor would have worked with gold dust. What would he have done on the other side of WrestleMania? Do you think don't really remember because, uh, you know, once we knew that that was not going to happen, his unhappiness with gold dust and working with gold dust. And you're thinking in different ways, like, okay, well, this isn't going to work moving forward. Couldn't tell you on the money says the opening intro for this show is one of the best they ever did. The music, the score, the narrator's voice. It was simple and effective. One of my favorite in your house pay-per-views who was doing these video packages back here. Was this still Sahadi? Um, probably Sahadi, Chris chambers. One of those two probably. Uh, Alexa wants to know whatever happened to the old in your house stage set. Is it tucked away in the warehouse or was it completely scrapped and thrown out as best, you know, it's, uh, Conrad's garage. Why are you saying that? That's not true because show them pictures uh, where you pull, where you pull the rolls into what are you, why are you being like this? Where's the set? Did and they you park out? it next to the Bugatti. Bugatti. Oh, you're adding new shit now. Does Vince have a Bugatti? Oh, see, see, you don't deny the rolls. You don't deny the other shit, the Bentley. And just cause I threw a Bugatti in there. Oh, well, I don't have a Bugatti yet. I don't it's have, not here yet. I don't have a Bentley anymore. Okay. Austin says to the best of your knowledge, has Sean ever landed his super kick on anyone? Now he's not saying that to be a smart ass, but has it ever connected a little too much? Oh yeah. It? Plenty of times. Sometimes you just got to get in there a little snuggo. Uh, super spreader event says the rumor had it that the, uh, diaper match was Jim Cornette's idea and X-Pac wanted out of his contract as a result. Do you remember that does feel like a Cornette thing? I could see that happening in Smoky mountain. Do you I'm remember sure it was a Cornette thing? Okay. Do you remember X-Pac being upset about a baby bottle match or was he cool? Ah, uh, he might've been a little upset about it. But again, I liked it. I thought it was a really good uh, culmination to their entire issue. Uh, Marcus says creatively, if you had a do over with Chris Candido, would you have done anything differently? Of course, he's in the dark match here, but we get lots of questions about Candido. Do you think he was just ahead of his time? Maybe the business wasn't ready for a guy, his height being featured. I mean, I didn't know. Don't take this the wrong way. I mean, but if, if Chris were six inches taller yeah. and 40 pounds heavier, then, you know, he would have owned the business. I just think that, you know, due to his size and, and, and somewhat, you know, a little bit, his attitude, um, you know, Chris had a chip on his shoulder and had a strong desire to, to be the best. And instead of trying to work around going, okay, 
how can I be the best in this environment? It was like, no, fuck you. You're all wrong because you're not letting me be the best, you know, where I want to be the best. So it just, um, I don't know. It, 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 uh, I like Chris. I think Chris was a hell of a talent, but I just think that more than anything, if you were to look at what held Chris back was his size. And that's a shame because he really had a love for this business. And in Chris's mind, he was seven feet tall. And that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a, you know, uh, Wayne says, what do wrestlers do when they have to spend the entire night under the ring waiting for their spot? Depends on the wrestler. Most sleep. What do you think undertaker was doing? Seances? Yeah, yeah. probably <laughs> had a Ouija board. <laughs> I don't know why that tickles me, but it does. Hey, one last one. Then we'll get out of here. Um, this is from Steve hates wrestling. He says, why did the heel to Tonka not work out? I thought his heel turn on Luger was really well done. And one of the better heel turns in the mid nineties. What say you? Okay. You're going to get this. All right. When Tataka turned heel and went into the whole, do you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Don't get hot. Cause I couldn't hear me. So I'm getting hot at you. Cause I can't hear me. Uh, it's par for course. I get it. <laughs> so ah, damn clouds. Okay. Um, when Tataka turned heel and went with the million dollar man, I remember his, his first promo when we went through all of these things that, you know, before Tataka, you know, bought his pants at the gap and this and that and all this other thing. And, you know, so now you're wearing Ferragamos and blah, blah, blah. And, and then he, he goes through the whole promo and everything that he mentioned about now that I'm with the million dollar man, I've, I've got Levi jeans and, and, and I'm buying my shoes at floor shine. And I swear to God in my head. And in that moment, that he was dead when he said he bought his shoes at Florsheim that was in every single mall in America that was, you know, the cheap shoes, the, or, and <laughs> he came back and said, Florsheim? He goes, yeah, they got nice shoes there. I said, I gave you Ferragamos and fucking Gucci and uh, all this shit. He goes, yeah, but, you know, I mean, most people, you know, they, they, they see the Florsheim, they know they're, they're, you know, they're, they're nice shoes. Bless his heart. I love me some Chris. And the thing about it was, was Chris was a snazzy dresser. Right. And Chris always had nice shit. But the floor shine shoe just still, to me, to this day, sticks in my craw. Well, hopefully next week won't stick in your crawl, but I think it might. You're probably going to be upset with me because we're covering the main event from 1991. It's February 1st. We're going to see Sergeant Slaughter and, uh, we're going to hear from him and we'll probably have a little I to talk. I'm, I think I'm busy. I think I'm busy. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that one. Well, the following week, it'll be Trish Stratus. Then we're going to cover Saturday night's main event from 06, then Undertaker 98, 99, then WrestleMania 12. Lots of good stuff coming your way. Don't forget you get all these shows early and ad free here on adfreeshows.com. Bruce, do you want to put a bow on this episode for us? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. What do you give in your house? Number six. It was a fast moving two hours by God. And I thought that it was a fun show to watch and revisit. Yeah. I think I say thumbs up. I, I like it. And I think you should go out of your way to watch that Owen Hart, Shawn Michaels match, two of the all time greats. I still think it could have been a main event on a pay-per-view, but we'll debate it another time. Next week, it's main event number five from February 1991, right here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Rock on. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.